Joseph over here. He didn't have to speak, but do you know the bit where the three kings come in? Now they're coming bearing gifts and they bring gold, frankincense and myrrh. This really happened. We were sitting there and they, I think, just went out of sequence. Because we talked a little boy afterwards and said, you know, are you okay with that? They said, yeah, why was that wrong? They just switched, didn't they, was it? Anyway, the three boys came in, little four-year-olds with tea towels on their heads, and they put these boxes down. And the first boy said, I bring you gold. And the second boy said, I bring you mare. And the third boy said, Frank sent this. is that kids will take a chance. You know, if they don't know, they'll have a go. And all right, they're not frightened of being wrong. Now, I don't mean to say that being wrong is the same thing as being creative. But what we do know is, if you're not prepared to be wrong, you'll never come up with anything original. If you're not prepared to be wrong. And by the time they get to be adults, most kids have lost that capacity. Uh, they have become frightened of being wrong. And we run our companies this, by the way, we stigmatize mistakes. And we're now running national education systems where mistakes are the worst thing you can make. And the result is that we are educating people out of their creative capacities. Picasso once said this, he said that all children are born artists. The problem is to remain an artist as we grow up. I believe this passionately, that we don't grow into creativity, we grow out of it or rather we get educated out of it. So why is this? Um, uh, I lived in Stratford-Avon uh, until about five years ago. In fact, we moved from Stratford to Los Angeles. So you can imagine what a seamless transition you know, this was from... Uh, and I actually lived in a place called Snitterfield, where, just outside Stratford, which is where Shakespeare's father was born. Are you struck by a new thought? I was. You don't think of Shakespeare having a father, do you? Do you? Because you don't think of Shakespeare being a child. Do you Shakespeare being seven? I never thought of it. I mean, he was seven at some point. He was in somebody's English class, wasn't he? Just <laughs> 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 How annoying would that be? <laughs> <laughs> Must try harder. Being sent to bed by his dad, go to Shakespeare, go to bed now, you know, to William Shakespeare, you know, and put the pencil down. <laughs> and stop speaking like that. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's confusing everybody. <laughs> anyway, um, we moved from Stratford to Los Angeles, and I just want to say a word about the transition. Actually, my son uh, didn't want to come. I've got two kids. Uh, he's 21 now and a daughter's 16. He didn't want to come uh, to Los Angeles. He loved it, but he had a girlfriend in England. Uh, this, this was the love of his life, Sarah. He'd known her for a month. <laughs> Mind you, they'd had their fourth anniversary. Because <laughs> it's a long time when he's 16. Anyway, he was really upset on the plane. He said, I'll never find another girl like Sarah. And we were rather pleased about that, frankly. Because <laughs> she was... <laughs> she, was, she was the main reason we leave the country. <laughs> but, uh... but something strikes you when you move to America and when you travel around the world. Every education system on Earth has the same hierarchy of subjects. Everyone, doesn't matter where you go, you think you can be otherwise, but it isn't. At the top are mathematics and languages, then the humanities and the bottom are the arts, everywhere on earth. And in pretty much every system too, there's a hierarchy within the arts. Art and music are normally given a higher status in schools than drama and dance. There isn't an education system on the planet that teaches dance every day to children the way we teach them mathematics. Why? Why not? I think this is rather important. I think maths is very important, but so is dance. Children dance all the time, if they're allowed to, we all do. We all have bodies, don't we? Yeah. Did I miss a meeting? I mean, I think. <laughs> Truth be what happens is, as children grow up, we start to educate them progressively from the waist up. And then we focus on their heads, and slightly to one side. If you were to visit education as an alien and say, what's it for, public education, I think you'd have to conclude, if you look at the output, you know, who really succeeds by this? Who does everything they should? Who gets all the brownie points? You know, who are the winners? 
I think you'd have to conclude the whole purpose of public education throughout the world is to produce university professors. Isn't it? They're the people who come out the top. And I used to be one. So there. You know. <laughs> but, and I like university professors, but you know, we shouldn't hold them up as the, uh, the, the high watermark of all human achievement. They're just a form of life. You know, another form of life. But they're rather curious, and I say this out of affection for them. They're sort of curious about professors. In my experience, not all of them, but typically, they live in their heads. They live up there, and slightly to one side. They're disembodied, you know, in a kind of literal way. You know, they, they look upon their body as a form of transport for their heads. <laughs> you know, it's... Don't they? It's worth getting their head to meetings. <laughs> if you want real evidence of out-of-body experiences, by the way, get yourself along to a residential conference for senior academics and pop into the discotheque on the final night. <laughs> and <laughs> there you will see it, grown men and women writhing uncontrollably <laughs> off the beat. <laughs> Waiting to end so they can go out and write a paper about it. <laughs> now, our education system is predicated on the idea of academic ability. And there's a reason. The whole system was invented around the world. There were no public systems of education really before the 19th century. They all came into being to meet the needs of industrialism. So the hierarchy is rooted on two ideas. Number one, that the, the most useful subjects for work are at the top. So you were probably steered benignly away from things at school when you were a kid, things you liked, on the ground you would never get a job doing that. Is that right? Don't do music, you're not going to be a musician, don't do art, you won't be an artist. Uh, benign advice, now profoundly mistaken. The whole world's engulfed in a revolution. And the second is academic ability, which has really come to dominate our view of intelligence because the universities design the system in their image. If you think of it, the whole system of public education around the world is a protracted process of university entrance. And the consequence is that many highly talented, brilliant, creative people think they're not. Because the thing they were good at at school wasn't valued or was actually stigmatized. And I think we can't afford to go on that way. In the next 30 years, according to UNESCO, more people worldwide will be graduating through education than since the beginning of history. More people. And it's the combination of all the things we've talked about, technology and its transformation effect on work, and demography and the huge explosion in population. Suddenly, degrees aren't worth anything. Isn't that true? When I was a student, if you had a degree, you had a job. If you didn't have a job, it's because you didn't want one. And I didn't want one, frankly, so... Um, but now, Kids with degrees are often heading home uh, to carry on playing video games because you need an MA where the previous job required a BA and now you need a PhD for the other. It's a process of academic inflation and it indicates the whole structure of education is shifting beneath our feet. We need to radically rethink our view of intelligence. We know three things about intelligence. One, it's diverse. We think about the world in all the ways that we experience it. We think visually, we think in sound, we think kinesthetically. Uh, we think in abstract terms, we think in movement. Secondly, intelligence is dynamic. If you look at the interactions of the human brain, as we heard yesterday from a number of presentations, intelligence is wonderfully interactive. The brain isn't divided into compartments. In fact, creativity, which I define as the process of having original ideas that have value, more often than not, comes about through the interaction of different disciplinary ways of seeing things. The brain is intensive, by the way, there's a shaft of nerves that joins the two halves of the brain called the corpus callosum. It's thicker in women. Following on from Helen yesterday, I think this is pro probably why women are better at multitasking. Because you are. Aren't you? There's a raft of research, but I know from my personal life. If my wife is cooking a meal at home, which is not often, <laughs> thankfully, but you know, she's doing. <laughs> she's, you know, she's good at some things. But if she's cooking, you know, she is dealing with people on the phone, she's talking to the kids, she's painting the ceiling, you know, she's <laughs> doing open heart surgery over here. If I'm cooking, the door is shut, the kids are out, the phone's on the hook, if she comes in, I get annoyed. I say, Terry, please, I'm trying to fry an egg in here, you know. <laughs> if, give me a break. Actually, there was a, do you know that old philosophical thing? If a tree falls in a, in a forest and nobody hears it, did it happen? Remember that old chestnut? 
I saw a great T-shirt really recently which said, um, "If a man speaks his mind in a forest and no woman hears him, is he still wrong?" <laughs> And the third thing about intelligence is, it's distinct. I, I'm doing a new book at the moment called Epiphany, which is uh, based on a series of interviews with people about how they discovered their talent. I'm fascinated by how people got to be there. Uh, it's really prompted by a conversation I had with a wonderful woman who may, most people have never heard of. She's called Gillian Lynn. Have you heard of her? Some have. She's a choreographer and everybody knows her work. She did Cats and Phantom of the Opera. She's wonderful. I used to be on the board of the Royal Ballet in England. <laughs> 